a COVID update from Craighead County and Jonesboro. And we've got with us Judge Marvin Day. We've got Dr. Shane Spites from NYIT and the City of Jonesboro Medical Director. Uh, we've got Chris Barber, who is uh, Chair of the Board of Arkansas Hospital Association. We've got Sam Lynn, who's CEO of NEA Baptist. By the way, Chris Barber is obviously CEO of St. Bernard's. And then uh, I will go ahead and turn this over to Judge Day. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate you, your efforts in getting this set up for us. Um, uh, can we get my screen where we're where you you're, uh, have got me centered there, Casey or Bill? You are centered. Okay, great. Um, I just want to start this off by just saying I, we've had a lot going on this week, uh, particularly on the, the COVID front. And I, I just really kind of felt like it was important to, uh, to, to get this out to the, to the residents of Craighead County in Northeast Arkansas. Um, as, as you will all know, um, you know, it, it kind of started out with the, our hospitals put out a press release just basically saying that we need some help. Um, and, and some efforts from the community and, and keeping them safe. Um, uh, later that day, the governor also uh, mentioned in his press conference that, that our local leaders um, really have got to uh, 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 step up our efforts in educating our people of the importance of a mask and, and, and keeping your hands clean. Well, then, of course, then later on this week, it was highlighted that, um, you know, Donald Trump's White House uh, task force put out a message directly to Craighead County. And it, and it really just said, we've got to we've got to do some things differently than what we've been doing. And, and uh, you know, in that press release, it put out a lot of things and, uh, you know, about mass testing and and some things that were really pretty extreme. Well, that that really caught my attention. So uh, yesterday we had a, a, a great conference call and it was just really trying to educate me and of what's going on. And, and uh, uh, that, that call was with the people that, are, are, that we're gonna hear from today. And, and it was just became very obvious that their message needs to be heard by you and by me. Um, and, and it was just that important. I just felt like we should take the time to uh, to, to hear from them and, and better understand what's going on with our healthcare family, um, uh, the doctors and the nurses and the hospitals. So uh, I'm gonna turn that over now to uh, Dr. Shane Spites with uh, NYIT um, and let him uh, have a few comments. So Shane. Thank you, Judge. I appreciate it. appreciate the time to be able to, to kind of go through a few things here. I'd like to just show a couple of slides if, if um, if, if it's okay, just I think to give a, a, a gra graphical representation of really what's going on. I'd like to start just for a second with what's going on nationally. For those of you that are watching this in the news, you're seeing this unfold that about 47 states across the US are seeing a significant rise in cases. And that's what this is showing right here. Actually, as a country, we're at our highest point uh, that we've ever been throughout this pandemic. We are certainly entering into our our third wave of this virus, as you can see by that graphic there on the left, we've seen over the last 14 days a 42% increase in our number of cases. A lot of these cases are, are in the northern uh, states. They're seeing a significant surge, specifically in the Wisconsin area. Uh, they're having a lot of issues in terms of um, hospitalizations um, and, and being somewhat overrun and overwhelmed, but it extends all the way over into Utah, Montana, Idaho, those areas as well. Unfortunately, as we don't like to see, deaths are also going up across the country, um, and those are up at about 16%. Um, looking here more locally here in the state of Arkansas, our numbers are up as well. We are also hitting uh, case levels that we've not seen previously. Uh, this, again, is a graphic representation of the state of Arkansas. In the top left-hand corner, you can see where we started and, and where we are now in terms of new cases. Um, the, the key piece, I think, on this graph is on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see this is what we're talking about here today, is the hospitalizations across the state, and specifically here in Northeast Arkansas. But we've seen a dramatic increase over the past probably 10 to 14 days, as this graph will show in our hospitalizations. One other piece I'd like to draw your attention to on this graph, uh, specifically in the top left-hand corner, when we look at cases per day, is the date that the governor put in place our mask mandate. He put in a statewide mask mandate on July the 16th. 
And so that was about right here, if you can see my cursor, right the, about the middle of July. Now we know from this virus and following this pandemic, it takes two to four weeks to really see an effect once you institute a change. And so when you fast forward about four weeks, this is what we saw. We saw that the mask mandate when implemented and when followed by the citizens works. Now, we can talk about what happened here at the end, end of August as schools started to come back. We knew that was going to happen. We knew we were going to see an increase in cases. Our hope was that the citizens would do the right thing, continue the social distancing, continuing the mask mandate that our governor put in place, and we would not get significantly higher. Unfortunately, we're starting to see those numbers creep up. Here in Northeast Arkansas, specifically Craighead County, you can see that our seven-day average is about 57 new cases per day. And we had 63 cases just yesterday. Our percent positivity rate from PCR tests is about 8.7% with antigen uh, positivity rate about 13% compared to the state average of 7.7 and 16.2% respectively. And we can get into those details as well. I don't think that that testing number and the positivity rate tells the whole story, but uh, we can certainly talk about that at a different time. I think it's important that you see these numbers, that these graphics uh, resonate with you in terms of the state of our county, the state of our region, and really what we're what we're dealing with uh, geographically. So I'll stop right there and actually turn it over uh, to Mr. Barber. Thank you, Dr. Spites, and we appreciate your steadfast leadership, uh, and certainly since the inception of this pandemic. Also, your extensive research of the, the topic, and then more importantly, your wise counsel and leadership, not only to the, the city of Jonesboro, but the entire region. So thank you for all your efforts here, and, and keep up the good work. Let me begin by saying all of our hospitals are here to serve. Uh, and we want to continue to do that for our communities. Um, we are picking up, some folks are delaying care uh, because they're concerned of COVID-19. We want to encourage everyone, please do not delay care. Um, the time is now to be proactive in your treatment options, early detection, so we can aggressively treat health-related issues. So please do not delay care at this point in time. All the hospitals and physician offices have made appropriate accommodations, uh, so please see those, those appointments. The purpose of today really is, one, to share some information you may not be aware of, two, to really answer questions that you might have about our local environment, and, and three, to really set the stage of where we are today and more importantly, where are we moving in the upcoming months ahead as we have flu in the winter months, which in turn historically have been the busiest time of year for hospitals and providers. So this morning, we want to give you a perspective of a snapshot of, of where we are. So you all have seen the governor's press conferences and all the detailed review of graphs of the seven-day rolling averages, the overall hospitalizations. We want to share with you what does that look like in Northeast Arkansas. So the first slide. This provides, there's 14 hospitals in Northeast Arkansas region. This provides a number of confirmed hospitalized patients. So uh, you'll hear a little bit about the community spread. This translates into hospitalization. So if you can see back on the left-hand side of this graph, starting in May 17th, we were rocking along uh, with fairly no, low numbers. Then we bumped up in July, had a slight increase, but I wanna draw your attention to roughly uh, September 26. Michelle, put your cursor on that. Um, 29th here that you see. So for the last 30 days, we have seen a significant increase in hospitalized patients in Northeast Arkansas, which has been dramatic here. Now, in, in our case, the, the Jonesboro hospitals account for about 78 to 80 percent of those hospitalized patients here locally. The balance are provided to care in the regional facilities throughout Northeast Arkansas. To date, our Jonesboro hospitals have treated over 1,350 COVID hospitalized patients in our uh, acute care facilities here in Northeast Arkansas. So some might ask, is this normal in the state or is it unusual for Northeast Arkansas? So the next slide will show you how this plays out throughout the state of Arkansas. 
again, we are the red uh, trend line here. You can see the dramatic increase here. And this is just a 30 day snapshot again from September 29th to October 29th. The top yellow bar there is the Little Rock metro area. So you can see they've been ranging between 140 or 160 patients uh, per day hospitalized in their the facilities down Little Rock. Now think about this. We all know the dense population in central Arkansas and Little Rock compared to northeast Arkansas. But this graph demonstrates and illustrates we have the same number of hospitalized COVID patients with a smaller demographic area. Now, many of you are familiar with northwest Arkansas and the spike that, that occurred a few months back. They are the gray bar on this chart. Um, so you can see they were able to bring that spike down and they've leveled out and basically flattened their number of hospitalized cases in Northwest Arkansas. So they took aggressive measures from industry, government, employers, et cetera, to address the issue. So we're pleased to see the progress there. We wanna show you this, that we are certainly trending in the wrong direction. So how does that play out if you put that in terms of percentage of increase? So for the last 30 days, we have seen a 112% increase in Northeast Arkansas hospitalized COVID patients. 112% increase in Northeast Arkansas. You can see the next is 57%. So that is significant. And I'll say for, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, the Northeast Arkansas hospital CEOs have been meeting weekly to discuss strategies, how to secure adequate PPE, which we're in much better shape at this point in time, how to secure ventilators, which we're in good shape there, expand capacity with our critical care units, uh, as well as provide ex effective staffing in this regard. So today, we are capable of handling the workload and volume that we have in our Northeast Arkansas hospitals. But I wanna be very candid with the group this morning. We cannot continue the trend that we're seeing right now. We cannot have consecutive months going into this winter time period with 112% increase in COVID hospitalizations. At some point in time, you can only flex so much you can only stretch so much. So we are putting everyone on notice. Uh, we don't have a major issue today, but if we continue this trend, we will have real problems in our community in the near future. So that is the thrust I wanna share with you. Now, we all know folks are uh, fatigued and tired. We need to get back to the basics when we talk about the importance of wearing a mask, of hand washing and social distancing. It's important we're seeing a tremendous amount of community spread in our region. Uh, and many of those folks are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. So make the assumption, one, if you don't have to go out, stay home. If you do, consider the things that you need to do and ensure that you're wearing your mask. It's okay to tell folks to pull their mask up over their nose. If you go through the drive-through to pick up dinner um, and you've got a young person wearing the appropriate PPE, um, Give them an extra tip if you're so inclined to say thank you for being a good role model for others because they're taking care of you. We want to improve the health of our region so we can take care of other issues as well. Um, you know, we have serious illness that we have to deal with on a day in and day out basis. The second piece is we need help too uh, with our healthcare workers. So in the state of Arkansas, 8% of the healthcare workers uh, account for the COVID um, cases in our area. Uh, we need to protect our healthcare workers who are out in the community as well, because there's going to come a point in time that we got to rely on all these folks, you know, for that time of need or that crisis in our area. So we are asking you today to one, share with you where we are. More importantly, we need your help to train, change the course of this trajectory here in the near term. So at this point in time, I want to uh, turn it over to Sam Lynn. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chris. I Appreciate your leadership and, and you as well, Dr. Spites. Dr. Spites mentioned the delay in time between exposure or even a positive test and hospitalization. So you've seen Chris show you uh, the trends for hospitalizations, but I wanted to speak just a little bit to outpatient testing and what the community spread looks like uh, from that perspective. 
So if you go back to a month ago, as Chris just referenced, late September, your local health systems were already testing hundreds of outpatients uh, for COVID-19. Late September, the positive rate for those patients has been right around 5%. Today, that positive rate is around 21 to 23%. We've even gone as high as 27% on a particular day. So we know that's a drastic change in the spread of the virus uh, and we'll continue to monitor hospitalization trends, but we're really calling on folks to adhere to the guidelines. We know they work. Uh, and I wanted to offer a couple of anecdotes for that. One, uh, about two months into caring for COVID patients at NEA Baptist, we tested about 1,700 team members just to make sure we understood whether or not the PPE protocols we put in place were working. Uh, and so out of that 1,700 people, less than half of a percent tested positive. So we knew that our folks that were taking care of these patients were safe. We knew that the social distancing, PPE, hand washing measures work. And so I wanted to offer that as an anecdote, but also this week we saw a study released by Vanderbilt University sorted hospitals uh, according to the patients they cared for and what communities they were coming from. So hospitals that were caring for patients uh, that came from mass required communities at a rate of higher than 75% saw nearly a flat curve, still some increase, but nearly flat. Hospitals caring for less than 25% of patients coming from mass required communities have seen quite an impressive increase uh, and a scary increase. And so we know that there's lots of evidence out there that shows that the trend goes the wrong direction when our communities don't follow the appropriate guidelines and recommendations. So again, we just ask people uh, to be responsible uh, and give this a lot of thought. Uh, certainly your healthcare workers need it. Uh, a lot of healthcare workers that are obtaining the virus are not getting it from caring for these COVID-19 patients. They're getting it from community spread from family members and people that they come in contact with that maybe aren't following the guidelines the way they should be. So we ask again, just for the sake of uh, our community, our community spread and our healthcare teams uh, to please help us flatten the curve and, and adhere to these guidelines. Uh, I want to kick it back to, to Judge Day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sam and, and uh, Chris and Shane. Uh, just really great information that you shared with us, and I, I appreciate your your time in, in doing that for, for our community. Um, you know, with hearing what I heard, it's it's hard for me not to stop and, <clears throat> and just want to tell our healthcare workers this thank you so much. Uh, we know y'all are leaning in uh, extra hard the nurses, the doctors, the, the people that keep you, the facilities clean, not just in the hospitals, but also the clinics. And, and just, we, we just want to say thank you. Uh, we appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, you know, our prayers are with you. Um, you know, right now, I guess in, in what I want to say from this point is, you know, we live in a great community and we care for each other. <clears throat> and I look back at the tornado and we had an emergency and we had a crisis. And, I, and I, my takeaway is just, I just, I want the community to hear that, that we need to kind of lean in and help each other. And, and, you know, we don't need to donate clothes and food and, and help clean up homes like we did in the, the tornado. We just need a little help with, you know, please wear your mask and, and keep your hands clean and uh, maintain your social distancing um, but also support your local businesses. You know, we, we don't want to shut the world down. We want to keep things going. Like, like Chris Barber said about, you know, seeing your doctor, we need to take care of our businesses and do those things. I also want to announce uh, when this came up, we got with the health department and um, they are going to do a drive through testing clinic there at their facility on Washington, corner of Washington and bridge on this coming Tuesday from 10 to two. So it's a self swab of your nose. So it doesn't mean that they, that you have to uh, stick it up far enough to touch your brain unless you want to. Um, but please take the time, go by and get tested. Um, so, but, but also today and Monday, the health department is, has kind of uh, opened up their schedules. If you want to run by their clinic, it's free. Um, uh, just go by and get tested. We, we encourage you to do that. Um, you know, if you feel sick, you know, uh, and you're concerned about it, get tested. It's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of things economically, you know, people worry about as far as their jobs, but, um, you know, but for me, you know, wear your mask, not necessarily for your own, um, 
personal safety, which I want that, but do it because you care about your neighbor and, and you want them to, uh, to be safe and, and wear your mask because you're ready to see things get back to normal like we all are. You know, we're all tired and, and ready for something else. So just would really appreciate the community to, uh, to do that and, and help us to, to support our hospitals and our healthcare workers and our clinics. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill um, and uh, let you kind of manage our questions that, that people uh, from the press may have. Thank you, thank you everybody. Yes, uh, thank you everyone. And, and Judge, while you're here, uh, Brandon Tabor from KASU asks, what was going through your mind when the governor asked, what is Craighead County going to do to decrease the number of COVID cases? <clears throat> okay, I hate to admit this, but I didn't watch the governor's address on Tuesday. So uh, I, I am remiss for that. I have been worried about roads and budgets and, and, uh, and some other things. So I didn't really watch it, but of course I read the, the comments in the paper and you know, I understand, you know, the, what the governor's saying is we, we've had the highest increase for six weeks in a row is my understanding. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, we, we do need to, as community leaders, sometimes you just need to stop and say, let's refocus on what's going on with this healthcare issues and the crisis and, um, and, and let the people understand, you know, we, that's really what we're here to do is just to educate the people about, you know, what's going on right here in your hometown, you know, um, and, and how that's affecting, you know, your doctors and your nurses and people that you care about. So that's, that's, after, after I caught back up with what the governor was saying, it, it, it made me say, hey, we do need to educate our people and help them understand. Uh, Dr. Spites, Brandon also asks, what other factors should be considered with the rolling average? In terms of the, the rolling average of new cases, I wanna make sure that I understand, Bill. Uh, I would assume that is what he's talking about. What other factors should be considered? Okay, so there's a, I'll just say this, there's when we, when we look at, at the virus in our communities in any geographic location, there's a lot of pieces you wanna look at. So you don't wanna necessarily just focus on one piece. Sometimes we get focused on the percent positivity. Sometimes you get focused on the, the number of new cases. We need to know that, that we wanna look at all that data, but really when you talk about the burden of disease in your community, it's your hospitalizations. We'd like for people to take all the measures that they, that they need to in terms of the social distancing, the mask wearing, everything that you've heard just presented here today. But once that's not necessarily heated, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna see your hospitalizations and your death rates go up. And so that's why we're here today is to talk about how significant that rise has been in our region and specifically in the Jonesboro and Craighead County area, but in, in many of the counties in Northeast Arkansas, it's not just specific to Craighead County. A lot of the counties in Northeast Arkansas are seeing significant increase in cases. And so uh, in terms of how we look for, from a predictive standpoint, there's a lot of different data points that we look at. Um, and hopefully uh, we don't just rely on hospitalizations because that's a later finding. Hi, Dr. Spites, this is Josh White with KAIT. And, uh, this is for the entire panel. Um, I'm curious because we're always talking about wearing masks and there seems to be some sort of stigma that is put that if you wear a mask, then you can't really do anything. So I would like all of the, the panel to kind of address, if you wear a mask, that is also a way that we can take care of local businesses because they will still al be allowed to be open instead of not wearing a mask and forcing possibly another shutdown. Josh, I appreciate that. And, and um, you're spot on. You're exactly right. The, the, the wearing of the mask, the idea behind it is that we can continue a lot of what we're doing today. I got my tire fixed today. I had a hole in my tire. I had to go get it fixed. I wore a mask. Everybody in the establishment was wearing a mask. Everybody was socially distanced. And I got my tire fixed and I was able to, to come, come be a part of this, this press conference. And so we can continue to do a lot of our daily activities through the wearing of the mask. What the big problem is, is and people don't understand is, we've got a significant portion, anywhere from 20 to 40%, depending on which study you read, of individuals who are sick and don't know it and who are spreading it and don't know it. 
And so you're spreading it to, to individuals who may have a bad outcome. And so this is a lot, it's an individual decision that affects the community. And so the mask wearing is something that, that an individual can take that makes a positive difference in their community in terms of viral spread. And we've seen that. I'll go back to the graph that I mentioned earlier as we started this. We saw a significant drop in the number of infections when the governor's mask mandate was implemented. Now, we've entered into some pandemic fatigue, some laxity, some I'm tired of this. And I think everybody that's on this panel here would, would agree that we're all kind of tired of it. But this is not the time to let up. We are being tested. Our resolve is being tested. And we have to step up and do the right thing, which is simple, in my opinion, is wearing a mask and social distancing. Uh, we have a, uh, a question from uh, Cubilla Hardin or Laganza Kale at KLEK. It says to the medical professionals, what would you say to those in the community who still don't believe COVID is real? It is real. And we see that we just shared with you, we've treated over 1,350 patients in the acute care setting. And there's hundreds of thousands of more that have been diagnosed with COVID. Now, in many cases, it can be mild, which we're thankful, but in other cases, it can be devastating uh, for families and friends and loved ones. And we've seen that here in Jonesboro. We've seen that here in Northeast Arkansas. Uh, and it does different aspects to different people. And Dr. Spice to comment on the impacts of COVID and the long-term effect potentially it has on that. So I would just echo what Dr. Spice said too about the mass wing. That is one simple thing that is in our line of defense that we can really assist to slow the spread at this point in time. We need to be responsible. We don't want to be the ones that infect our spouse or our parent or grandparent. Uh, that is the last thing anyone wants to do. And that's the first issue that comes up when someone's been diagnosed with COVID. So let's do our part uh, to try to slow that spread. Bill, hey you're on mute. Hey guys, this is Josh again with KAIT. This is for um, uh, Sam and Chris, if we could go Sam first, Chris second. You guys mentioned that a good majority of your nurses are catching COVID, not from the hospital. It shows that they're doing everything they can inside there. So what do you guys do to really try to bust the myth that your nurses and doctors are getting COVID because they're treating COVID patients inside these hospitals? Thanks, Josh. I, I think I think this conversation today and our press release this week is an attempt to go further in communicating uh, what's happening and, and how it's affecting our workforce. Our, our teams are certainly uh, being affected. And, and like I mentioned before, uh, most of those that are going out of work temporarily for, um, you know, exposure really more than anything else, uh, but also, you know, a few positives when we contact trace those back, I mean, they're certainly from community spread, like we mentioned. So uh, we know that internally and we've met, continued to message that to our teams internally. And then this week decided to take a further step to try to get some additional information in front of the community that represents, you know, how that's happening and why that's happening. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Sam's assessment as well. We recently conducted some surveillance testing of roughly 2,500 employees. Um, we also did contact tracing uh, and there was no commonality in a lot of those in a, a potential COVID patient. So that just really identified the community spread that we're seeing out here. Again, a large percentage of those were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic at this point in time. So I think folks are proactive in taking those steps to really try to hone in where is coming from and more importantly what can we do about it any follow-up to that josh uh just one i was going to see um if dr spites could almost go on a myth busting uh session talking about how if you wear a mask you you increase your chances of some kind of carbon monoxide policy uh poisoning or the mask tr mask truly doesn't protect you from possible, from possibly getting it, that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure, Josh. We can. Um, yeah, I, I'm fine to do that. I, 
the carbon monoxide, I, I think, I think first of all, carbon monoxide is produced by combustible engines. The human body doesn't produce carbon monoxide. The human body produces carbon dioxide as a waste product. And um, the studies that have, have that we've looked at on that do not see a significant drop in oxygenation or a significant increase in carbon dioxide levels. Um, we've got, luckily, we've got good compliance, um, like in our elementary schools and our elementary school teachers and things of that. Now, I'm not going to say that it's not, um, it's not something you want to do uh, forever. I'm not going to say that it's something that, that, that uh, I don't hear about at, at home sometimes in terms of wearing the mask all day long, but it's something that, that we have to do to, to reduce the spread. But in terms of a physiologic change to the human body, we have not seen detrimental change to the human body for the average person wearing a cloth mask. Um, I think uh, Judge Leganzi has a question about uh, voting. He said there have been a lot of people taking part in early voting. Uh, have you observed any, made any observations regarding mass compliance while voting? I have Leganzi. I, I drive by there quite frequently and check on folks and see how it's going. In my personal experience when I voted, um, there were probably... I don't know, 50, 75 people in line. And out of that, there was only one person not wearing a mask. Um, you know, everybody in the group was staying socially distant. Um, I've been by the Lake City voting place and, and uh, everyone at that time was wearing their mask and uh, uh, going, going very well. To Chris Barber and Sam Lind from Brandon Tabor, are we at a point of looking at creating makeshift hospitals? So that's a good question. And since the beginning, we developed a surge plan for Northeast Arkansas because we understood we're going to have to take care of our own people um, because everybody else will be facing the similar issues in the rest of the state. So each hospital has developed, developed a surge plan that, that uh, we have. We continue to scale that up throughout this pandemic and we've added beds along the way. So we have that in place uh, at this point in time. So the, the, the ideal situation is to be able to handle the patients in existing infrastructure and acute care facilities here at this point in time. We do have plans if it uh, exceeds beyond our reach for other locations in the community. Dr. Spites and other prov providers have been uh, very gracious in helping in that relationship, but our preference is to continue to scale up as much as possible in our acute care facilities that we have today. I'd only add to that real quickly and just saying, uh, Chris is exactly right. I mean, there's been a, some great collaboration amongst the hospitals in our region and working on surge planning and, and what the worst case scenario is, but the biggest threat of all to any of that uh, is the exposure to our healthcare workers. And so if we can't affect the community spread in the right way and keep our healthcare workers safe, uh, those plans become much more difficult. Bill, I'd like to add to that if you don't mind. Please, please do. You know, it, it, and it goes back to really the, the whole reason we're here today is, is, you know, we don't want to talk about, um, you know, extra capacity in hospitals and, and having to build, all, you know, temporary hospitals. We're asking the community, hey, help us out. Help, help the healthcare worker, you know, wear your mask uh, to, to keep those things from, from getting there. You know, you, you hear the, our leaders talking about that we're, our trend is in a, in a difficult spot and in a month or two, if we keep going like this, we're gonna have issues. And um, that's why we're just asking everybody to, you know, stay focused on wearing your mask and washing your hands and staying socially distant. Judge, you and, and, and really all of you, uh, Sarah Doan has a, from KJNB has a question that's, Along those lines, it says, what should businesses do that have a mask mandate sign posted on the door, yet patrons still enter without one? I've heard some businesses feel that there isn't much they can really do to enforce it. I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, you know, Sarah, I think going back, I, I, I really believe in our community, in the heart of our community. And, and, um, and, and I think if we all are cordial to each other and, and ask, say, hey, would you mind helping us and wearing your mask and, and, and protecting my employees and those sort of things that, that it'll work. Sure, we're gonna see some people that won't do it. Um, 
but I, I just really feel like that, uh, you know, the heart of our community that, that uh, you know, we'll all work together and, and make this happen. Hey guys, it's Josh White again from KAIT. And uh, this is for Dr. Spites, Mr. Barber and Mr. Lynn. I, I want to ask what is, the governor has been holding his, his conferences weekly now. And for the last six weeks, Northeast Arkansas has been in the lead, unfortunately. And it's always been, we have to keep asking, we have to keep asking, we have to keep asking. So playing off of uh, the previous question, what is the next step to actually pull this, pull this rise down? What is the, we've asked to the point where we're almost all blue in the face. So what is the next step to get this better under control? Hey Josh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one. I know you pointed it toward our healthcare leaders. You know, I, I think today is our next step. You know, if you really if you really want to, you know, to say it, you know, Donald Trump's uh, White House uh, task force uh, said, "Hey, look, guys, y'all need to get together and work on this." And um, here we are. You know, the hospital started getting their messaging out, and uh, uh, the mayor and I have, uh, uh, you know, are trying to encourage our uh the people here in northeast arkansas to help us so this is the next step and and in my heart i believe that our community will come together and and flatten this curve in the next uh you know two or three weeks um uh, I, I think people you know there's there's so much noise out there about um you know fake news and this and that and 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 uh and i just really felt like that today's event Letting the people that are that are at the tip of the spear of keeping our community healthy, um, let let the people hear from them directly and and understand what's going on and and I really think that you know uh, that it, that we're going to make a difference. Judge uh, Brandon Tabor has a question from a listener that I think touches on a point that we've all thought about. Uh, it says, "If I visit a business and they ask me to wear a mask, but they don't wear it correctly themselves." How do I respond to the business? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, we're all doing our best. I mean, we all know the best thing to have covered up is your nose. And, and if you talk, the first thing you do, your mask pulls down over your chin. So, uh, you know, uh, I think just trying to emulate doing the right things and, and being, cordial and respectful to each other is, is really the, the best thing there. Bill, what do you think? Let's take a couple more questions and wrap it up. I think that's a, a good idea right now. Um, the only other question that we've got left is from Brandon asking if these pressers will be as frequent as the governor's briefings. And I think the answer to that is, uh, well, actually Josh White has, has one more. So, Josh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. One, one real question. You guys are all here, but there is also someone who represents this district that is the head of a lawsuit against the state of Arkansas to try and pull down the national, uh, the statewide emergency. Are we sending mixed, mixed messages here? And is that causing more issues than anything else? You know, Josh, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think, you know, really, if you look at the, the heart of, of, um, of that lawsuit, they want your, they want your local leaders to step up and, and inform their people of what's going on. And, and, and that's what we're here doing today. So uh, I, I hope and embrace that uh, uh, the people involved with that lawsuit, you know, uh, Representative Smith and uh, Representative Sullivan, you know, will will embrace the message that we have today that, you uh, you know, we, we need to be uh, working together here on the local level um, and educating. You know, we're not, I just want to stress, we're not mandating anything. We're, we're just asking the community to come together and help um, and, 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 and to do that for others, uh, for your healthcare workers, for your neighbors, and just try to protect each other. So we're just, I think we're, I think we're all on the same page. And it's also relevant to say that that lawsuit has been tossed out by, by court. So um, 
the the uh, Brandon's question about uh, will these uh, uh, pressers be frequent as the governor's briefings on coronavirus? At this point, the answer would is we don't have plans for that. Uh, did you have a different answer to that, Judge? Bill, say that again. I'm sorry. Okay, Brandon's asking: Will these will these news conferences be as frequent, like weekly conferences? Are we going to meet weekly with for for news conferences? We have not discussed that, but uh, is that something that that we are going to consider? Uh, yes, Brandon, we'll consider it. I, I hope not. I'm uh, I, I I'm not a I'm not a big uh, person to do these, but I, I know it's my job to do it. Um, so I'm I'm really hopeful that that. Um, our messages out there and that we start seeing improvements in our, in our, in our data and in our trend lines and our hospitalizations and that, that we can go on and, and, and uh, start getting back toward a normal life by working together. But, but if we need to, and things get more serious, yes, we will, we will do whatever we need to do to uh, educate the people and uh, um, just let them know we care about them and that we want the best for them. Okay. We have uh, one final question, and it's from Brandon, and I think that would be for, for Dr. Spites and the CEOs. Are there any known super spreader events any, that we know of? Are there any, uh, have we had any super spreader events that we have identified? I'm not, I'm not familiar with any specific events uh, that, that have been held in Northeast Arkansas that are contributing to this rise. I think what we're seeing is more community spread is just, um, as a as a community, there's there's less adherence to the mask wearing and the social distancing. And I think to kind of back um, back up everything that's been said already. Hopefully, this is a message that will resonate with the citizens of Northeast Arkansas as we start looking at things like you know Halloween parties and um, and gatherings and things like that. As we start to get in this cooler weather, we know that things that this virus will spread more rapidly in cooler weather as individuals are more inside, uh, certainly during cold wet weather. Uh, but to, to the question, I'm not familiar with, with any specific super spreader event in our region. Uh, I would concur with Dr. Spite's uh, comments. We're not aware of any super spreader event either, but it's just a good reminder to look at any type of large venue or small venue in the appropriate uh, practice that we've described throughout this uh, press conference. Uh, I agree with that. I, I'm not aware of any super spreader event either. I, I think it, it's the, the small group gatherings that are, that are hurting us right now. Uh, and so definitely need some, some extra attention on that. As Dr. Spikes mentioned, going into uh, Halloween is maybe the kickoff of the holiday season. That's something that everybody needs to take into uh, consideration. Okay, I, we're going to wrap it up here. I think, uh, does anyone on this panel have any, any closing statement or any, any other comments that we want to address? I think one thing that I've heard is we always have talked about uh, underlying conditions being a, a very serious factor in uh, mortality or morbidity. And uh, our mayor is not with us today because he has been undergoing chemo treatment. So he is being extra careful. Um, but I, I, I believe I've read that the latest statements are that, that there are some young people and others dying that aren't the traditional, what we initially thought were going to be the stereotypical cases. Can, can we speak to that and then everyone give a, a closing remark if they have anything else to add? I, I could speak to that real quickly, Bill, and then just pass it on to, to everyone else. One of the things that I think um, that is, wasn't recognized early in this pandemic, which we are learning just more and more every day about the research, and, and I realize that can be frustrating um, as, as we get new information, then we push it out to the public, um, and, and, it, and it seems like it's disinformation. Uh, just bear with us as we're learning through this. And one of those examples would be, and I'm going to make a comparison. I hate to make the comparison because people latch on it too much, but in terms of influenza versus COVID, Influenza is a respiratory virus. You take it in through your nose and your mouth, it gets into your lungs, it pretty much stays in your lungs. COVID-19 enters in the same way, but once it gets into your lungs, it enters your bloodstream, and then it's got multiple organ systems that it attacks. It's got specific receptors to attack areas in the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the bowel, there's mul the liver, there's multiple areas that it actually goes after. And so because of that, it's kind of a uh, it, it's an it's an unknown outcome in a lot of people when they get it. So yes, if you have an underlying disorder, underlying disease, um, even if you're overweight or obese, it does put you at a higher chance. 
but it doesn't mean that that a regular individual with no comorbidities doesn't have a chance because you could have something and not be recognized by it. We've had individuals um, that are marathon runners that end up uh, bedridden for 14 days or longer, or even hospitalized. And so we're still trying to unlock all those secrets of this virus. It's a it's a very interesting, very invasive and aggressive virus, and we're just not quite sure right now how to be able to say, yeah, we know you're going to end up in the hospital. No, you're not. We don't have that right now. So um, I'll leave it with that is, in terms of this is, this is again, why it's so important uh, that everybody adheres to this, because we want to reduce this spread so that we can get into the period where we have vaccination available for everybody and then really combat the virus. Thank you, Dr. Sam, do you have anything to say before we go? Yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's almost, uh, not easy, but you can pretty much understand who's going to be really high risk. But outside of that, uh, the virus doesn't discriminate. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard people cite recently on a call, Chris and I were on yesterday with regional CEOs. Uh, you know, we've, we've started to see uh, some small examples of uh, second positive tests, you know, re-exposure of some sort. So uh, if anything, you know, we just continue to ask that people uh, be considerate about their use of PPE and hand washing and social distancing. Again, as we get closer to the holiday season, we certainly want to do our, our work to reverse this curve as quickly as we can and uh, get us closer and a day closer each each week uh, to enjoy life as, as we all want to get back to. Chris, anything to wrap up? I would just comment on what uh, my colleague said earlier. There's, obviously, there's been certain uh, demographics have been impacted, CERC and preconditions with hypertension, uh, diabetes. Is certainly, we've seen different outcomes for individuals in that regard. But hopefully, it's been informative today that we've shared some new information uh, to the community. We thank you certainly for your participation and engagement, but it's going to take all of us uh, to make a difference. And we're going to get through this, um, but it's going to take a day in and day out but every one of us in all uh, continued focused effort. So thank you all. Let me ensure Josh White does not have one more question. Josh, are you good? I am all good, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Judge, any last statements? Thanks, Bill. Yes. I, I, I just want to say thank you all for, for tuning in today and, and, and listening to, uh, to this information. I, I hope you found it informative and, uh, um, and help you better understand what's going on in our community. Um, you know, the, 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 I just want to really focus back on the, on the main message for me, which is when this thing started, you know, it, in my mind, we just need to make sure our healthcare system and the, and the wonderful people that keep it going are there to help and not overwhelm them. Um, um, you know, you hear our local leaders say that we're doing okay, but we're definitely, we're, we're, we're stretching our people and making it hard on our nurses and staff and doctors. And, and uh, we need to change that trend. So I just really want to focus back on that and, 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 and just doing little things. And we just ask you again, do little things like wearing your mask and staying socially distant and keeping your hands uh, clean. Um, really does make a big difference. And I know we're all tired and we're all ready to get back to normal. Um, but, but do that for the people that, you know, so we can get our, our nursing homes and assisted living facilities back to normal and, and take the stress off of that. Do those things so we can um, go back to having normal church services and normal Sunday school classes. And, and we just, we just ask for your help. And, and uh, I believe in, in the, the people of, of Craighead County in Northeast Arkansas, and I, I know you'll be there to do that for us. So y'all have a great day and a, and a wonderful weekend. Enjoy this weather. See you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the panelists were, were fabulous. The media, we appreciate you helping get this message out, and uh, we will be in touch. Thank you.